Yeah, he, uh, yeah, he's grown up. He's like a full-blown toddler now. Balking, running. Yeah, he's, he's sprinting. Yesterday, he climbed up on the couch for the first time, and he's a, he's a little wild child. He's so. a man's man. Yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a, he's, so far, he's a pretty typical little boy. He likes to explore and get into <laughs> things, and has a, lot, a little ball of energy, and yesterday, he, um, he didn't get his afternoon nap, and he was in such a bad mood, and he does this thing when he cries, where he just holds his breath, and then he just really lets it out, you know, it's like he does this wind-up, and we watch him, and we're like, oh, here, it's coming, it's coming. Um, so, you know, we're not gonna, we're gonna try not to let him skip his naps anymore from now on, so to speak. But, um, but yeah, he's doing good. He's doing good. My youngest grandson almost got kicked out of daycare. Oh, <laughs> Kelsey, <laughs> come on. <laughs> he's only Cam. two, and he just oh. he doesn't know how to show his frustration except by hitting. Oh. Mm-hmm. He hit the teacher. <laughs> oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> Good morning, saints. Good morning. Good morning, sinners. Good morning. The biggest attraction is right outside those doors as I watch the snow come down. <laughs> How beautiful is that? Yeah. So when you're from Texas, any kind of white dropping from the sky is beautiful. We love it. So welcome to North Shore. Glad that you're here celebrating the gospel this morning. Um, this is a morning where we, um, it's baptism of the Lord Sunday. And so we're going to be... Uh, remembering our baptism so as we enter into worship let's enter into prayer shall we gracious god we thank you that we have been called to this place and in this time that we have remembered who we are in you and we bring ourselves fully present like we expect to experience you anew this morning would you bless and consecrate our time together in Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see you guys. Happy New Year. I heard that it's snowing outside. Is that right? And that, that is a gift. Um, well, I, uh, I read a verse this week that really spoke to me. It's Romans 12, 2 says, Be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God. You know, and I, I think that many of us do feel tested um, during these uncertain times that we're in. Many of us are doubting, many of us are questioning, um, but I think that those doubts and those questions can serve a purpose to bring us closer to the will of God. So let us keep that purpose in mind this morning when we sing together. Please stand if you're able and let's sing together and worship this morning. Peace, be still, calm this soul. I need you here now. Restore my hope. I confess. I've been afraid, remind my heart, Lord, increase my faith, so I will run into the waves as courage comes to take fierce place with perfect love, with perfect love. Oh, what
I'll be changed from this creature I am. There will be peace in the valley for me someday. There will be peace, peace in the valley for me, I pray. No more sorrow or sadness, no more trouble. everybody. So um, there is a area of London where there are a lot and lot of pigeons, just pigeons everywhere. And they used to sell cups of food and, and you could feed them and it would land on your head and your shoulders and they're all over the floor and they kind of get in the way so they stop selling the food so there'd be fewer of them. Um, and the reason I'm talking about pigeons is um, Today is baptism of the Lord Sunday, and we read in Scripture that the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. Well, in Greek, the word for dove and the word for pigeon are the same word, and our translators have said, let's make this dove, because pigeons are kind of scrappy and messy, and they get in the way, and they mess up my car. So... I kind of like the idea of the Holy Spirit as a pigeon because, yes, pigeons are everywhere. And just like the Holy Spirit, they get in your way. The Holy Spirit will get in your way if you're going down a path that is taking you away from a deeper relationship with God. So next time you see a pigeon, just kind of smile to yourself and think, that could be the Holy Spirit. And uh, God is reminding us of our baptism today with frozen chunks of water. So, amen. <laughs> um, so, any children can meet me at the back door and we'll go have a lesson. Thank you, Joe. Yes, many bird-like creatures can be scrappy. I'm just saying, chickens, swans, ducks, all creatures I'm a little bit afraid of. Just got to say um, a couple of things. I want to have a few announcements before um, we have some time of prayer. Uh, we are celebrating this Sunday, Kids Cove birthday, four years old today. Amen? Yes, so we have little individually wrapped cookies for you that say Kids Cove is a way of celebrating because that's how we do it at North Shore with some food. So please take that home. Uh, kudos to our director, Sarah Montoya, who's here, and board members. Um, yeah, we have a great daycare and uh, child care center, and we have 40 kids on the waiting list last time uh, we talked about it. So uh, it's good and vibrant, and thank you always for uh, supporting it. We will have um, a new class and a new sermon series starting next Sunday. I'm going to open back up a connections class, which is what we call Sunday school here at North Shore. So I'm going to be picking apart the Apostles' Creed. Because I think we say those words, but do we really know what it is that we believe? And so we're going to take a really in-depth look at that. I'm going to be using um, uh, Adam Hamilton's book called Creed. If you have a Kindle, you can download it now. I won't be following it exclusively. It's a six-week sermon series. I think I will be in this much longer, particularly since I couldn't even... I wanted to make I a whole sermon series, not just I believe, but that word I. So we'll see. Y'all know how this turns out for me, um, but I know the Spirit will lead us. But get ready for that. We'll have a class. Myself and Jimmy and Janiel Adams will be leading that. So that will be in the in-between hours. Also, just want you to know that Can You Dig It, our um, Christmas Eve um, you know, we call it our miracle offering, is up to almost 20,000 now. Is that right, Barbara? Holy moly. It just continues to grow. So over $20,000 right now. Thank you. Give yourselves a round of applause. That's an amazing, amazing, amazing 
things that we can do with that. The men's barbecue and auction is going to be carry out only this year. Um, and we're setting up an online bidding for the auction. We still will have them displayed if you want to come and look at them. Um, but that event is March 6th, so get your tickets now. It's the way we support CRRC and our scouts. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. I want to continue, remind you to continue being prayer for Robin Grace, the death of Ricky Beal, for Letta Garcia and family in the death of Joe Garcia, for Dwayne Feakin and family in the death of Sharon Feakin, for Don Blair and family in the death of his sister, Linda Copeland, for all of those continuing to battle cancer. In particular, we lift up Rex Dowden. For Bob and Jim and Linda, and for Mike and Faith, Deanna, Bill, Roz, Diane, Dave, we lift up to the Lord. And for those friends of North Shore that are battling COVID-19, we continue to keep you in our prayers. And in particular, our brother, um, Reverend Michael Mummy and his wife, who's pastor of the other side of the lake, uh, as he and his wife have COVID-19. Gracious God, we come before you today. And so many things are happening around us and have been. This is the moment where we just can be still and indeed know your peace. But help us to remember that we can carry that peace into each and every moment of our lives. That when we feel really small, May we remember that we are much larger, that your world, your kingdom is greater than this. We continue to hold on to your truth. We do, we pray for our nation. We pray for our nation's leaders that they would govern with justice and mercy. We pray for unity and harmony within our country and around the world. We continue to pray for an end to COVID-19, for the vaccine, those in nursing homes and assisted living, our frontline workers. And in all that we have been through this, this year, you are God and we cling to you amidst all the many things we can cling to. We trust, we come together as community in the prayer that your son taught us to pray saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So as Joe was saying, we are celebrating baptism of the Lord Sunday. And so I would ask you to please rise for the reading of the gospel. John the Baptist was in the wilderness calling for people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and lives and wanted God to forgive them. Everyone in Judea and all the people of Jerusalem went out to the Jordan River and were being baptized by John as they confessed their sins. And John wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locust and wild honey. He announced, one stronger than I am is coming after me. I am not even worthy to bend over and loosen the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. About that time, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and John baptized him in the Jordan River. And while he was coming up out of the water, Jesus saw heaven splitting open and the spirit like a dove coming down. And there was a voice from heaven, you are my son whom I dearly love and in you I find happiness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. You may be seated. As I was looking at my devotional for this week, which just happens to be um, an evangelical Lutheran um, piece this week, it says this, bless you. It's such a sweet little sneeze. 
should hear my sneeze. Like, it'll, it, it'll level this whole sanctuary. <laughs> but it says this. Holy God, creator of light and giver of goodness, your voice moves over the waters. Immerse us in your grace and transform us by your spirit. I don't know about you, but I, have, I just have this... Um, you know, not only am I suffering from cedar allergies and feel a little dry, but my soul feels like it needs, right? It, it needs this immersion of grace and transformation within my own being. Light and water from Genesis reminds us of the eternity in which God exists, creating order out of chaos of unordered matter. It's something that we do all the time. We turn chaos into order, right? Or we enter into chaos. We can do that too. In the context of that immensity, the son, the beloved, is baptized to know himself, to know who he really is. And so too, you are baptized to know yourself, to know who you really are to be transformed into the surrender of yourself in which John calls all people to and to carry out their mission in the world just as he does. On this Sunday of the baptism of the Lord, I pray we can find ourselves before the river with the water lapping at our feet, spurring us on to join in this amazing grace and this transformation of our spirits and that that will spill out among those we're closest to. When we look just at the gospel reading from the baptism of our Lord, we do not see Jesus as fully as we see John the Baptist. I mean, we get a whole sort of image of him, what he ate, what he looked like. He always looked like, like a crazy hippie dude to me in my mind, right? But we don't get a whole lot about Jesus. But Jesus remains a mystery. While John stands before us in all the wildness of life that shuns interior buildings and grand cathedrals, eating what God provides in nature, speaking from the humility of a self that knows to whom it is indebted. Amen? You will remember that John says, I must decrease so that he can increase. That's what we're doing as Christians. We have to be reminded of that, that we are letting go of our personality. We're letting go of who we are so that we might live more fully in Christ. It's what Paul calls the mind of Christ. We must give more and more of ourselves away so that Christ within us is who we are. We know what John wears. We don't know what Jesus wears. It is that clear of a difference. John thought, though peculiar according to our standards, is a fully human creature, while Jesus given to hearing a voice no one else can hear, is mysterious and is identified in this sense in a way no one else has or ever will be known. In Jesus' baptism, as the Synoptic Gospel tells us, nature itself is upended. The heavens are torn apart. All creation in this moment of Jesus' baptism is altered. And out of that rupture comes the Holy Spirit in a form that is described as a dove. Now, I don't think it was an actual bird that came and lit on Jesus' shoulder. What I think is the mystery that we are encountering here is far greater than words. That something happened that people could actually see something coming down that was changing. The dove does not simply alight on Jesus because in the Greek, the word in scripture is this, es aton, can be said, what it means is that the Holy Spirit came into him. Not just a bird that was on his shoulder, right? That's how sometimes we see it, because we learned that in Sunday school maybe. But it came into him, and it's infused with the Spirit from God. And a new reality has come into the world, transforming all things, including those things we can see, and those things we can't see, like the voice. As befits this wondrous transformation, it's on the banks of the Jordan River, on the border between the wilderness and the land of milk and honey. That's where John stands, 
crying out for the people to repent and to be baptized. He comes out of the wilderness with a prophetic announcement that he is not worthy to serve, even in a lowly manner, the one who will come and bring a new kind of baptism to the world. A baptism that reminds people, initiates people, tells people who they really are so that they can live into that. Mark's point appears to be that the message of repentance was aimed at the residents of Judea, especially of Jerusalem, who enjoyed a fairly comfortable lifestyle. And they were residing in an island of wealth surrounded by a sea of poverty in the regions such as Galilee from where Jesus was born and lived. They were also known for their proximity to centers of power and the pursuit of great wealth. And surprisingly, many were responding positively to John's invitation. Because here's the deal, they had to acknowledge that there was something that they needed to repent of. That they saw something in themselves that they needed to give up because it wasn't working. They knew that there was something, that there was something more. And we don't know why John the Baptist cries out but we do know that Jesus is coming and Jesus is coming to change the world and our inner world. But like the earlier prophets, John has a vision that requires the people to prepare themselves through repentance and baptism in water. His washing is more than a ritual bath which the Jews had been doing for centuries. It was more than a repeated uh, sort of mantra or required by the law. This new bath has become the first sacrament of the church, a sacred moment in which something mysterious can happen. John calls the people to faith through repentance and baptism, and out of the wilderness came the voice that knew a faith as a gift essential to life. And the essential question about faith and its relationship to the sacrament, the sacred moment, is what faith? And even more precisely, whose faith? And the equally essential answer to that question is this. Whose faith? It's Christ's faith given to us, becoming our faith and becoming our desire to follow our Father. Do you see that? Faith, in other words, is what baptism gives to us. Through the Holy Spirit, in baptism, we are given the faith of Christ. The presence of the world of Christ's faith is the church. That's who you are. Baptism opens our hearts and our minds to becoming instruments that bring unity and peace to our neighbors. And I'll say that again, unity and peace. Because I wonder what you might need to do to bring unity and peace right now even if it's within your own family or to your friends. Polarity and disharmony has been the glaring face of 2020. What ways might we need to repent of ourselves contributing to divide and frustration in our world? Where have we been fearful and chosen aside other than Christ? And I'll say this again, it takes deep reflection because we can think we are on the side of God when we are not. How will you know if you are lined up with God? It's when you feel that peace within yourself. That's how you will know. Sometimes that reality, the faith of Jesus within the baptism is not so apparent to us. In the words of John the Baptist, we hear the cry to repent and be baptized but we don't always come confessing our sins. This is, a, this is a major practice of those of us who call ourselves Christian. I've been saying this over the past couple of years that we have to have a daily practice of looking within, right? of looking at what we might need to repent of. I wonder when was the last time you thought, I really need to repent. <laughs> Americans usually don't think in that way, maybe even people in the church. That, that's a kind of a weird word, but if we remember that that word sin means that which separates us from God, 
then there's a whole lot of things that I can see that might separate me from God in my day-to-day life. Amen? Maybe you too. The people came to him confessing their sins. To confess sins is to actually take our own inventory. We see a crowd responding to an action that then allows them to be washed and be freed and to feel new. Oh, that our society and communities would be washed in the baptismal waters. John, however, describes a very different baptism through Jesus. In Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit has the central role. It's not the water, it's not the people gathered. It's the Holy Spirit that is the catalyst. It is the Spirit rather than the washing that affects the transformation of the baptized. The Spirit creates a profound change in us, kindles in us a newness. We receive faith that does not result from our fulfilling John's requirement. Like if it was just a requirement, like he would come, he would confess, you might say some repentant things, but then you might go out that door and by the time you hit the parking lot, you still be thinking and, and living in the same pattern. If John's baptism is our focus, we may forget that we have been immersed in God's gracious welcome and transformed by the Holy Spirit. We can be caught up in our participation in the work of the church. We can get caught up in the political polarity. We can get caught up thinking we are working for injustice when in reality we are really spewing more hate. And in so doing, we fail to enter the mystery which is where God resides. And failing to acknowledge the mystery altogether. We live in a very low level in our humanness. We wanna strive to be human, but live into our divinity more closely with God. We may forget that the mystery, which is God's defeat of death in the resurrection, means we do not end It's the reason we come together to care about the world. The work we do may seem to be the goal rather than the life within us that grows from our gratitude and our love for one another because we see each other for who we really are and we don't see each other as separate, as we're one. Every person breathing, everything created comes from the one spirit of God. What did it likely mean for Judeans to repent and be baptized in the wilderness? The Greek word metanoia, which is often translated as repentance, is the combination of two words, meta and nos, that together describe a process of stepping out of one's existing mindset and adopting a characteristically different mindset. Tan, it's what you read in Romans. Metanoia has the connotation of having one's perception of the world and of oneself transformed. And quite honestly, as humans, we come in and out of that. Amen? If we're honest. Adopting, it's about adopting a radically different worldview and relating to the world in new ways. In church, one of the things we do is we help keep each other focused. Amen? because we all kind of have, you know, spiritual ADD, right? Squirrel, like, we'll, we'll take to getting involved in things of the world. So we help each other, right? Stay in the spirit, in the mind of Christ. Metanoia can also mean making a U-turn. Some people have to take a huge U-turn and, and change course. Within the literary context in the Gospel of Mark, the term pertains to one's ethos, and it's about turning his or her back on existing socioeconomic structures. And in the context of extreme poverty and the growing gap between the poor and the rich, repentance required not accepting the status quo as normal or as the only possible reality. It entailed course correction. It entailed a U-turn, envisioning an alternative reality and endeavoring to bring it to fruition. And seen in this light, those from Judea who came to be baptized by John, they had to reflect on their own complicity 
in existing in this, their own socioeconomic structures. They had to evaluate their own values and their own lifestyles. And they had to radically alter their commitments. And some would go to those waters and be baptized, and I imagine they would go back to business as usual. What we do for each other is we kindle that fire within each other all of the time. You see, their current lifestyle, characterized by wealth, was achieved at a great cost, and the cost is poverty for others. For that to change, for sustainability, for existing political and economic structures needed to be transformed. Accordingly, John is inviting people to embrace a new mindset and to try to see the possibility of a totally different reality. Even if we think it's not possible, let's dream about it. Let's imagine it. Because it is God's vision, as we learn from the prophecies that we, we looked at during Advent, this is still how God's vision for his creation is supposed to be. Such a task was a lot harder than the temporary excursion into the wilderness the Jerusalem elite might have been initially prepared for. When, G, when, when John says the whole of the Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went to jo, John is intriguing. Did they all? No. But it seems to suggest that repentance is not only individual, but also needs to be corporate and a national experience. John is preparing the way of the Lord primarily by returning people to the path of God. That's where things change. The story looks back to history, but it also seeks to move the community forward in a new light. I think it's time for Americans to head to the metaphorical wilderness for a moment, to reflect on our own values, the transformation of our own mindset, and maybe a whole course correction, to make sure we are not worshiping false gods or false dogma, amen? So we can get taken in. Yet the way in which the Messiah delivers God's people will shatter all expectations. He does not come as a violent warrior to overthrow the Roman occupiers. He does not appear in Jerusalem among the religious or the political rulers, but he comes in the quiet of the Judean wilderness, and he comes in the quiet and the stillness of your own heart. He comes among people who know they have gotten separated from God, coming to be washed in the Jordan. And though Jesus, through Jesus, God is on a mission to reclaim the world as God's own, beginning with each and every one of us. Through our own baptism into Christ, we too are declared beloved children. Don't you want to hear those words? Possessed by the Holy Spirit. God's gracious claim on our lives defines us and it gives us our purpose. The United Methodist Church has a beautiful liturgy for remembering our baptism. We don't rebaptize people in the United Methodist Church because we know that God was present, God got it right at that moment, but sometimes it's so beautiful to remember our baptism. Will you join me in this? So your part this morning is gonna be highlighted in blue. Sisters and brothers in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, God's spirit has been poured out upon water. Water poured over and immersing us. Water that flows freely for all who will receive it. Water from the streams of God's saving power and justice. Water that brings hope to all who thirst for righteousness. Water that refreshes life nurtures growth, and offers us new birth within. Today we come to the waters to renew our commitments to each, in each other's presence, to Christ who has raised us, the Spirit who has birthed us, and the Creator who is making all things new. So I ask you, will you turn away from the powers of sin and death? We renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, 
reject the evil powers of this world and repent of our sin? Will you let the Spirit use you as prophets to the powers that be? We accept the freedom and power God gives us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. Will you proclaim the good news and live as disciples of Jesus Christ, his very body on earth? We confess Jesus Christ as our savior, put our whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as our Lord in union with the church which Christ is open to people of all ages, nations, and races. Will you be a living witness to the gospel, individually and together, wherever you are, and in all that you do? We will remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world. Will you receive and profess the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament? We affirm and teach the faith of the whole church as we put our trust in God, the Father Almighty, in Jesus Christ, his only Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Almighty God, the life you birthed in us by baptism into Jesus Christ will never die. Your justice never fails. Your mercy is everlasting. Your healing river flows. Your spirit blows where you will. You cannot stop you, God. But sometimes we try. We try to block the flow. We redirect the winds of the spirit, or we walk so far away from the life-giving stream that we do not hear its sound and we forget its power. We parch ourselves. We are dry and thirsty, O oh God. Come refresh us. Come upon us, Holy Spirit. Come upon these waters. Let these waters be to us drops of your mighty mercy. Let these waters renew in us the resurrection power of Jesus. Most holy God, Abba, Father, may your, may your glory reign in us. Jesus Christ, Savior, Lord, may your glory reign in us. Spirit of fire, spirit over the waters, spirit over holiness. Eternal God, one in three and three in one. Amen. So we've done this before, uh, many years ago, but there's these little plastic tags that I, we made for you, and they hang over the spigot of your shower. Right? They're a great reminder, especially if you, you know, if you, if you shower once a day, that every, every water is immersed with the Spirit of Christ. So you can come to the water in your shower, remember your baptism, you can come and repent, you can imagine it, that water flowing over you and everything that you need to get rid of going down that drain. Are you with me? Yes. That every day repentance is something that we must do because every day we are bombarded by so many things. Come to the waters. Amen. O oh, soul, are you weary in trouble? No light in the darkness you see. There's a light for a look at the Savior, and a life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes 
upon Jesus. Look full to his wonderful face. And the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting, he passed and we followed him there. Over us and no more has dominion. For more than conquerors we are. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying. His perfect salvation to Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace, and the things of the earth will grow strangely The light of his glory and grace. What an amazing last line that we are left with. And the things of the earth will go strongly, uh, will grow dim in light of his glory and, and, and praise and his peace. So as you go from this place, may you remember that to keep that peace, that when you find yourself not at peace, that you may need to repent, you may need to draw away so you can get back into the closeness of who you are in Christ, that it can be within you. And then you can pass it on, amen? amen. Go in peace. Oh, one more thing, sorry. If you want to be in the class um, that starts next time, send me an email. I, I think I've got plenty of books. Again, you can get it on your Kindle, and we'll begin that next Sunday at 10 o'clock. See you then. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The things of the earth will grow strangely dim.